All right, the sun is down, the stars are out, drinks are served, and it's time for another mini mysteries. Tonight, giant creatures, unknown cryptids, weird remains, a photo of a saucerman, and a story you probably wish you never heard. Hey guys, ML Behrman here, and welcome to another episode of Mini Mysteries. Tonight, uh, we're going to do articles that I found while researching other stories that weren't quite big enough or uh, detailed enough to make a whole episode on. But nevertheless, they're pretty crazy. And I want to thank everybody that uh, responded to the polls I posted on my um, channel, because that's how we picked the topic for tonight. And there were also some great stories. So if you want to read some incredible stuff from people that uh, had encounters with weird stuff in the desert or other places, uh, go check out the comment section. Now, last week, um, well, I had some follow-up, or at least last episode. Um, remember, we had a story about a guy who had vomited up some strange creature. And I thought it might have been a parasitic twin, you know, the remains of a twin that were absorbed uh, while his mom was pregnant. But a couple of people said, no, it couldn't have been that, that that's not what would happen. And uh, I've, you know, I profess no medical knowledge, so I wouldn't know. But what they suggested, and it sounds entirely plausible, is that sometimes people with mental problems swallow stuff compulsively. And this stuff can build up in their stomach. And then when they vomit it up, it can be all sorts of weird stuff, bones, hair, uh, whatever. So they thought maybe that's what that might have been instead of a, an actual creature. Although the article uh, specified said it, it had a body and a head and, and hair and stuff. So who knows? But I thought that was interesting. And, and thanks for responding. And if you remember, one of the other articles was about giant sea turtles that attacked a steamship. And then also my own experience with a giant sea turtle and some people um, have actually seen large sea turtles and, and shared their experiences. And I thought it was really cool because I was amazed at the size of the animal. Now, whether they were attacking ships is something else altogether. Uh, tonight, we're going to do four more, like I said. Um, you may notice I'm looking a little shaggy, but that's because uh, uh, water's too precious out here to bother shaving. And you didn't come here for beauty tips anyhow, right? So let's fill our cups tonight, uh, root beer and vodka, because everything goes great with vodka, and get going. All right, tonight, our first story comes from Los Angeles, California, and it happened way back in 1915. And the story goes like this. A guy who owned a house on the outskirts of town. Now, at the time, Los Angeles was still very rural, uh, so he had a big yard, big lot. And he got up, and he noticed there was a fresh pile of dirt near the edge of his yard. So he went over to look and he discovered what it was actually was something had burrowed into his yard. Now, when I say burrow, they're talking about like a three and a half foot hole, two of them going down into the ground that looked like they had been dug out by claw marks. Um, there was dirt thrown out, you know, like an animal digging, which is exactly what he thought this was. But the tunnels were so deep and so large that he couldn't see down all the way, and he really had no idea what it could be. So he, he went to work and came back that evening and checked, and the holes obviously were still there. But a neighbor told him that they had heard something growling and, and making a weird noise in the night. And, of course, he's freaked out. What could this be? And, you know, is it going to attack me? Is it going to attack... Uh, kids, whatever. So he contacted the city authorities <clears throat> and asked them to send someone to investigate. And the city authorities rounded up a crew, and this is straight out of the article, that consisted of four guys, a lion tamer, two tiger trainers, and a snake charmer. Now, where, how these guys were on payroll, I don't know. And I mean, who put snake charmer on their resume, right? It's like, okay, snake charmer. <clears throat> anyway, these four guys come over to investigate and they look at the burrow and they're like, yeah, this is obviously dug by some sort of animal, some big animal. And from the claw marks, it it's, you know, look, could be pretty fierce. 
All right, so what to do about it? Well, <clears throat> someone's got to go down there. You know, they, someone's got to crawl down into that tunnel and see what it's at the end of it. Because, you know, this is 1915. It's not like they got a remote camera or something they could send down there. So the four guys have a confab, and they all point to the snake charmer. <laughs> They're like, yo, bro, it's on you. You got to go down into the hole. So this guy, to his credit, got down on his hands and knees and started crawling into this hole. And he got just enough in to where his body started, you know, his feet were sticking out. And he heard the loudest, deepest growl. And, man, he backed out fast, came out of there, and he said to the other two, F this. It's not a snake. I'm not needed. I'm out of here. And he left. So now you got the, the lion tamer and the two tiger trainers have to figure out what's in this hole. So they're like, I ain't going down there. So what to do? All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the butcher and get some horse meat. Because back then, I guess you could get horse meat at the de uh, butcher. And we're going to put it in front of the hole and see what comes out to eat it. And then we'll know what it is and, and how to deal with it. So that's what they do. They put this pile of raw meat at the opening of the hole and, and back off. Now, the article doesn't say whether they spent the night watching or they came back or whatever. It just says in the morning, the meat was still there. And it didn't look like it had been disturbed. And it didn't look like anything had come and gone from the tunnel. So they're like, okay, well, that idea didn't work. So what are we going to do? And they decide someone's got to go down there. So one of the guys, it doesn't say who, got down on his hands and knees and started crawling into the tunnel. And what did he find? Yep, trainer's hunt beast find toad. Now, I know you're probably going, a toad? What the? <clears throat> Hear me out. If you look at the article, it actually said that's all that was remaining in the tunnel. But something else had dug the tunnel. And... The three guys crawled all the way to the end of the tunnel, and they didn't find any droppings, any uh, hair or anything that would lead them to understanding what could have done this. And <clears throat> basically, they told the guy, hey, you're on your own. We're out of here. And they left. Now, of course, a lion tamer, tiger trainers, I'm sure they didn't have that much uh, science background. <clears throat> so the city sent an actual... Uh, biologist out there and he looked at it and what did he come up with he thought it was this a badger <clears throat> he thought a large badger had come and dug the hole because badgers have claws they growl they're fierce um, but why it would dig a hole that big why there why two of them um, I don't know that's the thing about it that's the mystery so the article calls them mystery holes. So I thought that was fascinating. That after all that rigmarole and with this cast of characters, snake charmers, tiger trainers, and lion tamers, that they came up with a badger and a toad. Uh, didn't say what kind of toad. Um, that's pretty strange. So that's our first story. What do you think it was? Was it a badger? Was it a toad? Was it something that we have never seen before? Okay, our next story comes from National City, California, and it's in 1952. Now, if you know anything about my channel, you've seen a lot of stories about UFO sightings, crashes, encounters out in the desert. Because for some reason, the desert in this part of California seems to be like the Bermuda Triangle for UFOs. And you've also seen episodes where I've detailed stuff that goes back to the 1800s and before as far as uh, weird aircraft or spacecraft or whatever being seen. So um, this one in the 50s is really when the whole contactee thing started. And it started out here with people like George Adamski and, and uh, George Van Tassel at Giant Rock who, you know, encountered flying saucers and aliens and, and spoke to them and, you know, the whole contactee phenomenon really started out here. And in the 50s, it was really going strong. And um, 
at that time, people in that area of California had been seeing weird lights, like a blue light that was leaving smoke trails and stuff like that. And some people said they had seen a craft. So these stories were coming into the papers and being reported to the radio and stuff like that. And a guy shows up and he said, not only did I see a UFO, a flying saucer, land, but I saw a being get out of it. And I got a picture. And so he gave him a picture. And uh, his story was that he had been out looking for UFOs and had found a real secluded area. And he was out there with his camera. And lo and behold, he saw the blue light and it came down and it turned into this saucer and the saucer landed and a hatch opened and this bean got out and started looking around. So the guy jumped up with his camera and took the picture, which you would think would be the billion dollar picture, right? Uh, the alien or whoever, in his words, freaked out, jumped back in the spaceship and zoomed, took off at a high rate of speed straight up and was gone. Uh, okay, that's like, all right, you got the picture, let's see it. So he brought it to the paper and they ran with it on the front page. And uh, what is it? Here we go. Okay. Saucer man photoed. Now, if you look, you probably went groaning, but if you look, the, the transfer from the original paper to the microfilm I got it from is really bad. You can hardly make out anything other than there's some sort of figure in the foreground and a ship in the background. But don't be disappointed. I took the photo, I cut it out, and I took it into Photoshop and cleaned it up, and I got a really clear image of it. And prepare to be completely amazed and disappointed, because there it is. Now, to me, that obviously looks like miniatures, like some toy, like that figure of the saucer man probably came out of a box of cereal, and whatever that spaceship is supposed to be in the background looks like a piece of hardware that fell off a lamp or something, or a lamp stand. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty disappointing to say the least. Right. But, uh, you know, I give the guy credit for, uh, trying. And what's interesting to me is that this whole phenomenon was so new at the time that when a guy showed up with an actual photograph that the paper ran with it, even though if you look at it, you can see the proportions are way off and the, the depth of field and it just looks an obvious, uh, miniature setup. Um, but I thought it was cool that there was actually a photo of the saucer man. So you guys have a look. I'll put it up again. See what you think. And do you agree? Miniature or the find of a lifetime? All right. Story number three. Now, story number three also is about a flying object, unidentified. Well, identified flying object, I guess. But it's not a craft. It's a creature. And um, if you watch my channel, you've seen I've done a lot of things on giant birds or giant flying reptiles. Because apparently a lot of people have claimed that they've seen something that looks like a flying reptile or a surviving dinosaur. And it's one of the most fascinating things to me because so many people report it. Now, from all over, from Death Valley over to Arizona, you know, over to uh, down to Joshua Tree. Um, but this story comes from Texas, San Antonio, Texas, in 1976. Now, I had found this article when I was working on one of my giant flying creature episodes, but because it happened in Texas, I didn't include it in mine. But we're doing many mysteries, and we don't care, right? It was reported in California, at least. Now, apparently, there is a cryptid that they see down in Texas that has the name of, obviously enough, Big Bird, which is, as it sounds, a giant bird. Now, the idea of giant birds goes way back coast to coast in this country, back to Native American times, because, and you can find rock art <coughs> of it, excuse me, that I'll put up, of the Thunderbird, right? And the Thunderbird was supposed to be this giant enormous bird that kind of looked like a big eagle or raptor. And there's a lot of discussion of, of whether it's a metaphorical um, 
uh, image, thought, or if it's an actual flesh and blood creature. Because some people swear it is. Some people say, no, it's just, you know, like I say, a metaphor for other things going on with the culture at the time. Now, uh, this modern flap, pardon the pun, uh, actually dealt with giant birds and, and things that people have seen. And this particular article uh, details three women, only says one, but three women that had an encounter with it. And I'm going to put up the article now. Now, I'm going to actually just read the article because it, it says it all and it says it very well. So here it is. Big Birds Buzz Teacher, San Antonio, Texas. Teacher Patricia Bryant says the two creatures that swooped over her car were as big as small airplanes and resembled prehistoric birds. Mrs. Bryant was one of three teachers who reported the latest sightings of Big Bird, a large feathered creature reportedly seen throughout South Texas in recent months. Scientists identified one of the birds seen recently, though, as a blue heron. But Mrs. Bryant is sure the one she saw looked prehistoric. She said an encyclopedia identified the creature as a tetradon. Notice I said tetradon and not petrodon like I did in another episode. She goes on, it was the biggest thing I've ever seen alive, particularly flying. My lord, it, petrodons, tetradons, lived like 160 million years ago. It's just unreal, she said. Well, that's the article. Not a whole lot more than that. She saw something big, and she's adamant that it looked prehistoric and was not a blue heron. So, uh, surviving dinosaurs in Texas, in Death Valley, anywhere around the world, the Congo? Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? All right, our fourth story tonight involves another giant, but this one on two feet. And it has some very familiar aspects to it. Now, it comes from Walla Walla, Washington in 1903. And a little background. Now, one of the things that science always says about any cryptid, especially Bigfoot, is that there's no skeletal remains. There's no body. There's got to be some fragment somehow surviving of, you know, its death or its existence, right? I mean, you need proof, a body. And there's also articles where throughout uh, history, weird bones have been dug up of different sizes and some, you know, uh, are quote, giants. Now, I'm not talking about 30-foot-tall giant. I'm not talking about some biblical uh, giant, you know, 12, 18 feet tall. I'm talking something seven to eight and a half feet tall and broad and ape-like, right? Because, I mean, that's what people think they are. So uh, this article details one of those cases, and I'll put it up right now. Strange Skull is Unearthed. An Oregon man finds a curious specimen on Basket Mountain. Now, the skull, he had been out exploring and happened to see a river bank where the water had washed away, eroded some of the bank. And in there was a skull in the mud, and he fished it out and washed it off. And it was absolutely enormous. Now, the measurements they give it were like 10 inches across the face and almost two feet from back to front. And it had an enormous jaw attached with teeth. And the teeth were human-like. They were molars uh, that were perfectly, they say stand up perfect, which I assume meant even. Um, and it looked human-like, but also at the same time, it looked ape-like. They thought it was a missing link or an ape man, because that's what the article says, is, is that the skull is of some ape man. And the measurements, in addition to the size they gave you, also said it had a human-like nose, and that the eye sockets were like two and a half inches across, which are big. But what I thought was most interesting is that the measurement 
they measured from the bottom of the nose cavity to the top of the or bottom of the upper lip, which on me is maybe that big, right? Well, they said this thing measured six inches. Six inches, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, between its nose and its mouth. I mean, that's an absolutely enormous uh, skull. And now, there's no picture of it, unfortunately. And what's so maddening about all these articles I found, and I have found lots of strange skulls dug up articles, is that they never seem to get to a museum or to a scientist. They're always like, well, we shipped it east to a museum and they never got it, or uh, it was lost in a in a storm or something. Um, or for some reason, the guy just lost it when moving from house to house. So there always seems to be this dearth of actual physical material of, ironically, what is our only physical material for any type of giant ape-like hominid remains, if that's even a thing. So uh, that was the giant skull, strange skull he dug up. They thought it was an ape man. But since we can't see it, we don't know. So I'd be curious what you guys think. And I want to use that as a segue to something. And one of the things I got on the polls that people wanted to see, uh, hear a personal story from me about something. And I do have one about something giant I found uh, in the wild. And I'm going to warn you, you might not want to hear this, but I'm going to tell it anyhow. So let's freshen our drinks and we'll be right back. All right, let's go. Um, hopefully this won't get people too upset. Anyway, 30 years ago, a much younger me uh, had the hots for a certain young lady. And uh, she asked me to take her camping. And I'm like, okay, you want to go out, you know, pretty far out there. That's where I like to go. She's, oh, yeah, yeah. But I don't want to go to the desert. I want to go out to where there's trees and, and greenery. I'm like, okay. Uh, I know some real remote spots up in the Los Padres National Forest, way back up in there that I, I've taken the Jeep into and camped a few times. It, it, there's some beautiful spots. She's like, okay, but I want, there's got to be a bathroom. And I'm like, uh, a bathroom? I go, it's not camping if there's a bathroom, I mean, if you're not squatting with the animals, you ain't camping. It's like, no, there's got to be a bathroom. I mean, this gal is a real princess, right? Uh, so I thought, I'm like, oh, you know, I know a spot. It's perfect. It's at the top of this mountain. I don't remember the mountain now, but um, there's a back trail up, Jeep trail, that at the very top, there's a primitive campground that almost no one knows about. And when I say primitive, I mean it's just a flat piece of ground. But there is a bathroom. Well, at least it's a it's a porta potty that's sitting on a cement slab, and it doesn't even have a, a door. I mean, that's how remote it is. It's just a, like a three-walled shed with a john sitting there that you can sit on and overlook this giant valley in front of you as, as you do your biz. I mean, it's beautiful, but uh, it's, it's about as primitive a toilet as you're going to get. And I thought, well, you know, I know she's going to bitch when she sees this, but, you know, once we're there, I got the keys. What you going to do, right? So uh, it takes us like all day to get up in there. And I had taken the Jeep in there. And with her, I had my truck. And I'm like, oh, man, how am I going to get this thing up there? And I made it. I had to bomb up this goat trail. And I mean, I'm like breaking brush, knocking over like, you know, four foot saplings to plow in there. And I get in there and park. And it's like I say, it's just a little open spot at the top of a mountain uh, with this John, Johnny on the spot, whatever you want to call it, sitting off to a side. And I, you know, I get there and I turn up the engine. I'm like, yeah, what do you think? You know? And she's like, she's like, like no way i'm staying here this is this no way and i'm like what do you mean no way this is beautiful it's you want remote and nature this is this is it it's like no this is scary as hell i'm not i'm not gonna spend the night here in the dark i'm like yeah, well 
I'm like, come on, you know, let's just get out, look around, you'll see how nice it is. It's peaceful. And trust me, there's like the back country is a lot safer for people than around campgrounds of people. Because I mean, where there's people, there's trouble. Where there's animals, yeah, there's sometimes, but 99% of the time, nothing's going to bother you, right? So I go, let's, you know, let's just get out and, and just look around a little. So she gets out and she doesn't even move past the hood of the truck. I mean, she's like leaning right on the grill, just like, like, you know, I'm like, what are you expecting to see? She's like, well, what's up here? I go, oh, you know, it's like squirrels, raccoons, you know, just little things. Now, there were bear and I had seen the biggest mountain lion up there the year before. So, I mean, but, you know, they're not going to bother you as long as you practice animal safety uh, in your camp. So she's like, you know, I don't know. And I'm like, well, look, I'm going to take a, I'll take a walk around. Just look, make sure nothing's here. You know, what, what was I going to do anyhow? Right. So, uh, now where I had parked was on this little slope that's up from where the bathroom was. And it was a sandy slope that came up and then leveled off. And then it was, you know, deep woods around it at the very top of this mountain. And I walk around the back of the truck and I had just literally cleared the tailgate and I looked down in the sand and there are the biggest line of tracks, footprints coming from down the hill, past the bathroom, up past where I had parked and going off into the woods. And I mean, these are big tracks human footprints. Now, so, oh, it's Bigfoot. Well, I've seen weird, quote, Bigfoot tracks, and they don't look like this. Look like a human. Like you had seen someone's footprints on the beach sand. They were just huge, and they weren't that far apart. Now, I've got an episode coming where I'm actually going to show you some video I took of some stuff I had found where I couldn't even match the stride. I had to jump from footprint to footprint to make the the stride. But these... I could have walked in, even though the feet were gigantic. And so I'm sitting there looking at this, and she comes around the corner, back of the truck, and comes up next to me, and she looks, she's like, you know, what are you looking at? And I go, what do you make of that? And she looks at it, and nonchalantly, she just goes, wow, that's a big foot. And I went, yeah, put those words together. And she goes, big foot. Bigfoot. No effing way. We're out of here. I'm not staying two more minutes. You know, we got to get out of here. She's like really freaking. I'm like, cause I mean, there's a line of track. So I'm like, no, not like, oh, they're, they're, they gotta be human. Okay. It's, it's who they are. I don't know. And she goes, well, they could still be here. You know, what if they're, who is it? Blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. She says, well, we got to go. We got to go right now. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to have to drive all the way back. That's like a four-hour drive just to get down off this mountain. And she's like, no, no, we got to go. I'm like, well, okay, we'll look. You get in the truck and lock the door. And I'm just going to just give me 15 minutes. I just want to backtrack these tracks down the hill a little to see where they came from. If there's like a a car parked down there, uh, not a car, but, you know, a, a four-wheel drive vehicle hidden down there, or, or if there's like a, a dugout or something, you know, where this person came from, let me just look real quick and then we'll go. She's like, well, what if something happens to you, you know, and you got the keys? And I'm like, okay, I'll leave you the keys. You lock yourself in the car. I'll be back in 15 minutes. The only thing I ask is if I come running up that hill, unlock the door. Like, don't dick around and, you know, try and find the lock. I mean, make sure that door is unlocked, it's just, which didn't help the situation. But she's like, okay, okay. She gets in, click, click, locks the door. So I walk, I follow these tracks back down the hill to uh, where the bathroom is. And I come around, I follow them around the corner of the bathroom. Now, like I said, the bathroom's open. There's no door. It's just a shed stall with a cement floor. And a John right there. And nothing had, no one had been up in this area for months in this little campsite because there were no tracks, there were weeds overgrowing, you know, the the path. 
And the floor of this bathroom, which was open to the elements, was covered with like dandelion fluff and pollen and dust. So you could see every track if anyone had used it. And there were tracks, but only one type and really weird. And this is where it gets crazy is the tracks had come around the side of the bathroom, stopped, and then backed into the stall. Like the person had walked backwards. And now, okay, now excuse me for getting graphic, but when a guy comes up to a toilet and does his business standing up, he leaves tracks at the front of the toilet. When a guy or a woman sit down to do their business, they leave tracks in the opposite direction, but at the front of the toilet, right? Like you're sitting. Not these. These backed up and stood on either side of the toilet, straddling it. I mean, these huge footprints straddling this toilet. And the toilet was one of those uh, forest-issued ones, which are they're high to help out if anyone, you know, is handicapped or anything. So to stand straddling this toilet, I mean, those are big, long legs because I'm 6'2", and I couldn't have uh, done it very well. With, and I'm looking like, oh, man, whoever this was must have been really tall, you know, to be doing this. And why this behavior? I'm like, okay, maybe it was, you know, you didn't want to sit on the seat, so you straddled. Okay, I can understand that. But to back in and, I mean, pardon me, you're going to have to put your pants somewhere, right? And so I'm standing there looking at this going, this is really bizarre. And I hope you're not eating. And I'll try and be very delicate. (laughs) I I did look into the pit of hell to see (laughs) if there was anything to see. And I saw the absolute largest unbroken piece of human fecal material I've ever seen. I mean, you talk about pinching a loaf. This was the whole loaf. I mean, it was huge. And there was no toilet paper. No toilet paper anywhere. And like I said, no one had used this for months. So there's like really nothing in there except this huge deposit. And there's no toilet paper on the on the rolls. Or I'm like, okay. And it didn't look like the feet had shifted at all. It just stood there and then walked straight out and gone out and gone around the corner and back up to where my truck was parked. So I'm sitting there going like, you know, I'm trying to mentally put together like, like what? Like who? This is freaky. Like who's up here barefoot doing this type behavior in the middle of nowhere and then just like walks off into the woods. And the tracks were fresh, and I was going like, well, what if he does come back? And no sooner had I thought that, all of a sudden I hear beep, 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 me, you know, someone laying on the horn of my truck. And I'm like, oh, my God, the mad shitters, must, he must have come back, and he's, he's, you know, up at the truck, and my girl's freaking out. So I go tearing out of the bathroom. I go around the corner to where I can see the truck, and I'm expecting to see, like, some huge, you know, like, shaking the truck or something and uh it's nothing there's nothing there she's just laying on the horn and so i run up there and and i'm like i locked the door you know open it i'm like what you know did you see something and she's like no you're just taking so long you know so i was honking the horn i'm like you know he scared the crap out of me literally as i'm looking at this other crap uh and then she goes, well, what did you see? You know, did you see anything down there? What was it? And I'm like, I was like, I didn't see anything. Don't ever ask me again, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to tell her. And and I couldn't explain. I was like, okay, I don't know who's up here, but I really don't think I want to run into him. And especially at night with this gal who is already freaked out about the darkness, or at least the area. And once it got dark, she was really going to trip. So uh, I locked the doors, started up the truck, and uh, headed back down the hill. And, oh, it was a hell drive getting out of there. I mean, it literally turned into like nine hours once we got down the the hill and to try and find some place to camp that was suitable for her. Uh, And 
uh, needless to say, that was the last time I ever took her camping or actually did anything. But, uh, yeah, wow. You want to talk about a crazy story about something big out there. There's something big out there, but I don't know what the hell it was. And I really didn't want to find out. So, uh, I give it to you for what it's worth. <laughs> if you want to comment what you thought it might have been or, or could be or whatever, I'd love to hear it. And uh, I hope uh, no one lost their lunch over that one. But anyway, that's four mini mysteries for the night, plus a crazy story. I'll have more coming up, I'm sure. And uh, I did get one request to end the episode like this. So I will see you guys later.